Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming uh, and opting to stay inside and not be outside on a degree, a day that's like 34 degrees or whatever it is. Um, your love of science is not unnoticed. Um, so just a reminder that uh, this talk is uh, being recorded. So if you don't want your face to appear on the camera or on the subsequent video, then just keep your camera off. If you don't want me to say your name when you ask a question, just send me a note privately. I assume if you send it to everybody um, that, uh, that you're okay with me seeing your name. Uh, you can also raise your hand uh, in, the, in the chat so that I can call on you maybe when there's a nice pause in the talk to, to ask questions to our speaker uh, who's graciously um, uh, you know, joined us today. So uh, with, without further ado, I'm gonna um, uh, introduce our speaker today. Um, so Jun Wan is a research fellow at the Martinez Center for Biomedical Imaging uh, at Massachusetts General Hospital and our Harvard Medical Schools. Uh, where she currently works with Drs. Bruce Rosen and uh, Jonathan Polineni. She received her PhD in 2017 uh, with a major in electrical engineering and a minor in statistics. Her thesis work, mentored by Dr. Greg Glover, uh, focused on modeling and analysis of brain spontaneous fluctuations. Her current research focus is to integrate um, state-of-the-art high-field MRI imaging and multimodal techniques to probe the origin of brain circuit dynamics. So, Thank you very much, Dr. Chen, for choosing to join us today and taking some time out of uh, whatever your quarantine schedule looks like to, to give us this talk. So thanks a lot. Really appreciate you being here. OK, um, thanks for the introduction and also inviting me to uh, give a talk. So um, the topic I'm sharing today is on the statistical and physiological considerations for fast fMRI data. And I hope we can inspire some interesting discussions here. And also feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. Um, okay, so actually Mahler just have a very nice introduction of me. Uh, I just like briefly go through it again. Um, so I received my undergrad in China um, in biomedical engineering. And then I kind of like flew uh, used across the Pacific Ocean and then now uh, received my PhD from Stanford University. So my uh, thesis work was supervised by Dr. Gary Glover and the title is uh, Temporal Characteristics of Brain Intrinsic Activity Based on 3T fMRI. So that's where I basically get most of my training in fMRI uh, methodology, statistics, and resting state uh, brain activity. And later I... <laughs> kind of head further to the east side and now I'm a research fellow in the Martino Center. So uh, my current research focus is um, on the methodology of 17 high resolution high field fMRI and also integrating fMRI with other uh, neural imaging modalities like EEG and PET to achieve a comprehensive view about brain function. So uh, collectively I think fMRI methodology is really a big part of my training and what I have learned is that fMRI is really a powerful tool, but it's also uh, fMRI have very complicated uh, signal characteristics. I think this is also the theme of the like, two topics I'm sharing today with you. Um, and the first is kind of uh, long lasting controversy regarding the potential physiological confines of uh, fMRI signals. So um, we all know when neurons go active, uh, it will change the, uh, you will alter like, uh, introduce more like blood flow to the active site. So increased oxygen in this blood flow will alter the relative ratio of oxygenated hemoglobin and deoxygenated hemoglobin. But because deoxygenated hemoglobin is paramagnetic, so if we change the relative ratio of it, it will alter the MR parameters and will finally cause an increase in fMRI signals. So collectively, when there is a neural firing and then you will see an increase in fMRI signals. Um, but fMRI is not really a direct measure of neural activity. There are other um, sources kind of regulated by the sympathetic nervous system, uh, autonomic nervous system, um, like heart rate changes or respiration volume changes. They're also going to alter the relative ratio of the oxygenated hemoglobin and deoxygenated hemoglobin. So it will also cause a change in fMRI signals. So when you see observations of fMRI, it's hard to infer it's really due to local neuronal changes 
or it's just an epiphenomenon of the systemic physiology. Uh, I think I'm going to talk about like this concern in the context of resting state functional connectivity. Um, and for the second topic, uh, it's about the confusion regarding the benefits of fast sampling. I think due to um, the recent advances in MR techniques, previously probably you have one brain time frame, you would take about like two seconds to acquire it. But nowadays it's possible to have snapshots of uh, multiple brain um, dynamics like within um, the fixed amount of time. So um, this is kind of like the question raises when we first start to implement it when I was a graduate student at Stanford. So many people came to my PhD advisor were asking, oh, so now we have the option to go faster. So how fast is fast enough for my specific study? And also um, when you sample the data to a faster and faster regime, the signal characteristics will be quite different. So what is the optimal pipeline to analyze this fast fMRI data? We also kind of hear some doubts uh, raised by some researchers because we all know fMRI is highly autocorrelated in that sense, whether we can really benefit from fMRI if we kind of uh, make the sampling rate faster. So um, for the second line of my present uh, presentation today, I'm going to clarify some concerns raised uh, regarding the benefits of first sampling. Okay. So um, the first uh, project is kind of a recent one where we show um, both fluctuations coupled with systemic physiology can show some structured patterns uh, look very similar to those resting state functional networks. Um, so if we put the subjects inside the scanner, uh, not doing any task, we simply inspect how the signal intensities evolve over time and you can see uh, here. So the different colors here just shows the uh, raw signal intensities. And you can see it's very colorful. And then the red means positive changes and then the uh, blue means negative changes. So you can see lots of dynamic uh, fluctuations going on, but they are not pure noise. About like 20 years ago, um, and researchers found like if you place uh, voxels or look at like time series from remote brain regions, they will exhibit certain degrees of temporal synchrony. Um, so nowadays people commonly refer to them as functional connectivity. So regions demonstrating stronger functional connectivity are considered to form a network. Um, so there have been uh, multiple resting state networks have been identified to date. So this just shows an earlier calculation. Um, so different colors, uh, regions with uh, similar colors are considered to belong to one resting state networks. And then uh, later people found this functional uh, connectivity can relate to aging or behavior or people's IQ and sometimes like the um, depression or different psychiatric or neurodegenerative disorders. So making a very popular tool to seek for cognitive or clinical biomarkers. Um, but as I have mentioned, um, there's always a concern about potential physiological confounds in fMRI measurements. So this is not a new knowledge. And actually there are lots of studies that help demonstrating like slow changes in the systemic physiology can cause considerable bulk fluctuations. Uh, I just give some simple examples. So an early one is the respiration volume per unit time. So if we look at the red curve, um, this is the direct measure from the respiratory fellow. And then uh, you can see not just the, uh, its frequency, but its amplitude, the envelope showing here, which is the blue curve, also fluctuates a lot over the course of a single scan. And if you correlate to um, both time series across uh, different brain regions, you can see it accounts for quite high percent variance in different brain regions. And it's kind of to be considered to relate to entitled CO2 levels, which is a potent vessel dilator. And another is the heart rate variability. It kind of mirrors how cardiac outflows changes from bit to bit. And if you correlate the heart rate uh, changes time course to both fluctuations at different temporal delays, and you can see actuation patterns like kind of uh, covering most of the gray matter regions. And there are many others like entitled CO2 or blood pressure. They will all cause kind of uh, notable changes in uh, both signals. 
So uh, we call them a kind of slow physiological fluctuations because in literature, when people, uh, probably in most of the literature, when people talk about physiological confines, they always think about those high frequency changes kind of coupled to respiratory cycle or cardiac cycle. Um, but for these kind of slow physio changes, it actually falls in a much slower frequency band and overlapping with um, the spectra of common resting state uh, functional connectivity. Um, so making it very hard to address just by temporal field theory. And not just about their spectral characteristics, um, their spatial patterns are also quite different. For those changes coupled to high frequency uh, cardiac or respiratory cycles, um, they always kind of localize to large wings shown here. But for these kind of slow systemic physiological changes, it kind of affects uh, widespread cortical regions. Um, for instance, here, um, this is a waveform showing the envelope of the respiration traces. And here it shows the voxel-wise um, bow time responses. So each column uh, is one uh, voxel. Or each row is one voxel. And then you can see a coupling between um, each voxel's time series and then the respiratory measures. And it really affects uh, uh, lots of brown voxels. So the problem is like if this systemic physiology will trigger uh, homogeneous patterns across different brain regions, we won't be worried how much uh, our functional connectivity measures will be confounded. But it's not likely the case in reality because the systemic physiology um, kind of goes through different brain regions. It's kind of filters through uh, the vascular anatomy with heterogeneous patterns across the brain. So it will kind of incur uh, like different uh, physio responses in different brain regions. So it's further possible that when two regions demonstrate synchronous bow fluctuations, it's just because they have similar responses to a common systemic physio change instead of they share um, like synchronized local neural activity. Um, there's a very nice study kind of demonstrating this point. Um, so in this case, um, they induce a minor hypercapnia challenge. So we'll alter the entitled CO2 level as measured by the red curve here. And also will cause changes in um, global um, both signals. And then they apply independent component analysis as a common way to um, decompose the four dimensional FMI data into multiple spatial patterns related to resting state networks. And then here are the patterns identified from this study. And you can see they really look like those common resting state networks. But if you look at their time cores, they are strongly coupled to the entitled CO2 measures. They only differ slightly in their shape and delays. But all those subtle changes can already make our algorithms to think they arise from uh, different components. So this is just an illustration that uh, apparent connectivity can arise from regional differences in the physiological responses. Um, okay, so um, I think kind of it will kind of inspire like three questions. Um, and first is like, are the physiological responses consistent across different brain regions? Um, and second, if they are inconsistent across different brain regions, what are the spatial patterns formed by the um, these uh, heterogeneous physio responses. And the third question is, if they can form some structure patterns, um, do they look like those common resting state functional connectivity? So before moving on, I just want to clarify the definition. By typical functional connectivity, um, it kind of refers to the temporal synchrony um, between remote brain regions due to similar local neural activity. But for this apparent physio connectivity, we refer to temporal synchrony um, between remote brain regions due to consistent uh, physiological responses. We also want to highlight that uh, even we call them uh, physiological connectivity, they're still regulated by uh, parasympathetic and sympathetic activity. So it also carry neural information. Okay. So um, the idea to characterize region-wise physiological responses are very straightforward. We just harness the statistical power of HCP uh, big data. And then, um, so we focus on two types of physiological changes. Um, the first is um, heartbeat interval changes, kind of like heart rate changes. 
So for instance, this is a pulse oximetry measure and we compute uh, how the average heartbeat interval within a six second window changes across the time. So you will have a sliding window measure of the mean heart rate across time during the scan. And another measure is uh, respiration variation. So in this case, we just take the standard derivation of the amplitude of the um, respiration measures and see how the respiration variation changes over time. And then um, we decompose voxel-wise physical responses. So for each brain voxel, we have the bow time series. We also have a common uh, respiration variation or heartbeat interval input. And then we deconvolve the impulse physio responses um, corresponding to either physio processes for each brain voxel. So then we will get a four dimensional measure of voxel wise um, either cardiac responses or uh, restoration responses. Okay, so uh, we'll just show the results. Um, this shows the results averaged across all subjects. And then um, the red curve shows how the time core FMI signal changes when there is a uh, um, decrease in your heart rate. And then by looking at the standard derivation, you already see uh, there are lots of heterogeneity in the patterns. And then I'm going to show a movie kind of demonstrating how the spatial temporal patterns of the response are. And then, um, so they're evolving in real time. Uh, in this case, like the most salient distinction occur between the gray matter and the white matter ventricle regions. Okay, so here are the respiration variation responses. So basically it shows when there is an increase in heart rate variation, uh, what the global both signal will look like. But in this case, we notice like the most um, salient distinction occur within the gray matter regions. Okay, um, so we have seen like these physio responses coupled to either dynamics or spatially heterogeneous. So to look at the structure patterns within either dynamics, uh, we just apply k-means clustering. Um, so this is the cardiac responses. Um, akin to our observations, um, if we just cluster into two major components, we can see segregation between gray matter and white matter ventricle regions. Um, to test the reproducibility of the data, we kind of separate the total number of subjects, like 190 subjects, into two equal cohorts, and then derive the response from either cohorts. Um, and then you can see the patterns are pretty reproducible. And then if we keep increasing the number of uh, components, and then we start to identify some structural patterns look very close to uh, some like resting state networks. And then um, if you look at the mean time course within each cluster, um, they're highly reproducible across uh, cohorts. And um, we also apply k-means clustering to look at the structural patterns within the respiratory networks. Uh, and in this case, when um, we apply k equals two and the most obvious distinction occur between those primary sensory regions and those frontal parietal regions. Um, because the most um, obvious distinction occur within the gray matter. So the next question we check is how similar are these patterns kind of to um, the common resting state networks. So to do that, um, we first genera, uh, generate a synthesized data set, which contains pure RV dynamics. But um, how to do that is that uh, we convolve um, voxel-wise uh, respiration responses with each voxels, uh, with each individual's respiration volume fluctuations. So this data will be considered to only contain those um, physiological dynamics. And to generate clean uh, functional activity, um, there is no ground truth. We just try our best to remove all the nuisance factors we know and also project those um, physiological dynamics out of the data and just try our best to um, generate a clean spontaneous activity. And then uh, we postulate the brain into 17 networks based on an early uh, Yale atlas. 
and then uh, take the mean signal within each network and compare how the linear uh, Pearson correlation pattern formed by uh, either pure RV dynamics and the spontaneous uh, neural activity um, to see how similar they are. And here are the results. So um, I wouldn't say they're totally look identical to each other, but they do have like uh, shared patterns as kind of shown here. And we also notice like um, in some subjects, these uh, coupling to those physiological dynamics can be very substantial. Uh, I'll just give an example. So in this case, um, this is a respiration variation measure over the course of a single scan. And these are the mean time course average within each uh, resting state network atlas. And you can see in all those networks, the time course kind of um, closely track those respiratory uh, variation measures. Um, and then if you apply ICA to um, these measures, and then you can identify multiple ICs, and those still kind of show very strong coupling to the respiratory variation signal, but they probably differ slightly in their shape and structures. Uh, if you look at their spatial patterns, um, they really uh, kind of, it's kind of striking. Um, it kind of shows some patterns you commonly consider to uh, be resting state networks. So I think this is a bit similar to the earlier hypercapnia challenge study where um, showing probably some regional differences in these physiological changes also show some structure patterns um, to a certain extent look like those resting state networks. Um, so it kind of depends on your study goals to really consider these fluctuations as um, a nuisance or really as a, a neural in, of interesting signals. But if we treat them as nuisance as um, many studies do nowadays, um, apparently because it, due to its heterogeneous patterns across the brain, we cannot use one single waveform to model it and project it out of the data. So for instance, um, people always use global signal regression uh, which just assuming these physiological confines or motion confines are um, homogeneous across the brain and then take the mean signal across whole brain and project it out of the data to remove these confines. So if we look at the time course averaged within a primary sensory region, like the right regions and those frontal parietal regions, the blue region, and you plot them together, um, you can see if you inspect their time course, there is really just a delay regarding how well they couple to the respiratory variation. But if we apply global signal regression, um, and then it will remove lots of variance from either signals, we will also introduce some artifact, artifactual anti-correlation patterns in the data. So this kind of potential pitfall um, first discovered by Kevin Murphy uh, kind of long ago when they were talking about the caveats of global signal regression. But here in this particular setting, we just uh, imagine its relevance for regressing out these uh, physiological dynamics using one single uh, kind of waveform. Uh, and here are the group level results. So even if we um, apply global signal regression to either simulated uh, RV dynamics or to the clean spontaneous activity of, we obtain from the data, uh, we can still see a strong um, kind of resemblance between uh, the patterns formed by either dynamics. And we also uh, um, analyze the seed-based uh, connectivity. So if we place a seed in the primary visual cortex and compare the spatial pattern uh, formed by pure uh, respiratory variations, and then those uh, clearing uh, spontaneous fluctuations. And then we can see um, there is certain correspondence here in the pattern derived from other dynamics. And if we place a seed in the dorsal PCC region, um, we can still identify certain similarity in the resolved patterns. And if we change the pre-processing pipeline, uh, including global signal regression, um, this kind of correspondence uh, remain. And in particular, I want to highlight those anti-correlated regions shown by blue here. Um, they do have a very nice uh, correspondence to each other. So um, just to do a quick summary about this part, um, I think we just try to show like 
uh, fluctuations coupled to systemic physiology uh, can demonstrate patterns kind of look like common resting state functional connectivity. Of course, uh, there are hundreds of studies out, out there kind of demonstrating the functional relevance of those functional connectivity. Here we just demonstrate um, there is a, another potential contribution from the systemic physiology to observed connectivity patterns. And these are supported by answers to the three questions we asked at the beginning of the talk. Uh, first is like uh, these physiological responses are especially heterogeneous. Um, and second, um, like these kind of heterogeneous patterns uh, can form some structure patterns. And finally, uh, these patterns to some degree uh, look like those common um, fun resting state functional connectivity. And um, it's hard to say whether we should treat those uh, fluctuations as nuisance or signal. But if you treat them as nuisance and want to derive cleaner neural representations of connectivity measures, you probably uh, want to use more complicated models instead of just a single waveform based regression to address these concerns because they are really heterogeneous across different brain regions. Um, there, why, as per why this kind of physiological dynamics uh, demonstrate some patterns similar to uh, neural patterns, uh, we have some hypotheses, but we're also open to discussions. Uh, and then this work has just recently published in NeuroImage. So if you are interested in some like technical details, um, you can go to check it. And I'm also happy to um, discuss it if you have other thoughts about it. Can we, can we maybe pause here for some uh... Some questions? Is that is that okay? Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> so, uh, Alyssa, do you have a question? Go ahead. Yes. Hello. Um, if you could go back a few slides to where you were showing the two matrices, I just had a clarification question. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, on the left, you're showing just the contribution from the RV dynamics without the sp spontaneous "quote unquote" activity. Is that right? Yes. They're just like, um, this is a synthesized data set uh, generated by pure those RV dynamics. And then we parcel it into different functional networks and show the uh, correlation uh, connectivity matrix formed by these uh, pure RV dynamics. I see. Um, do you know what it looks like if you, um, mm -hmm. if you don't, uh, if you kind of combine the two, like if you have both clean spontaneous activity and the RV dynamics, does it look more like the RV dynamics matrix? Or does it look more like the spontaneous activity matrix, if that makes sense? Yeah, I know what you mean. I think it's more like a data you didn't clean the, uh, uh, remove the physiological dynamics, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Of them. But also like depend, because they are not totally identical, it's kind of the relative fractional contribution from either <laughs> will making kind of more like each other, uh, which one, yeah. Okay, so it'll more just be like, equally a blend of the two, you think, as opposed to? Oh, I think it depends on your data. If your data doesn't have strong like fra uh, fractional contribution from physiological dynamics, um, it's kind of more cleaner representation of your spontaneous activity. It may look more like the right side. But if your data, for instance, uh, the subject take like deep breaths during the scan. I see. Well, yeah, it will probably have more weighting like toward those uh, RV dynamics, yeah. Okay, so it really depends then on your subject. Yeah, that's a tricky part. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question about um, how then, like other. I mean, you, you deal with some of this looking at how to when you regress with GSR. Mm. Um, you know what happens when you deal with. You know, I guess how do other kind of nuisance regressors interact with this? Things like. Um, mm you know, the first in 24 or any of the motion kind of correction methodologies. Uh, have, you, have you looked into that or did you use, I guess, the version of the HCP that's kind of cleansed for that type of motion? Oh, yeah, I think it raised a pretty good question regarding, because in here, I'm not like, I assuming, because uh, there is cases where like those motion merits will be coupled to those physiological dynamics. And here in the discussion, we primarily were consider they kind of um, for those uh, motion regressors and those respiratory changes or the thing, they represent different information. So I wouldn't, um, so in the pre-processing of the spontaneous activity, I do project those uh, motion regressors out of the data and I wouldn't expect to 
cause any difference in the results if you address them or not. But there are cases when the physiology are coupled to motion that can make things slightly more complicated. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Great. Thanks. That, yeah, sorry. Let's, let's you move on. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> if I didn't cover, we can talk about it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Thanks. Um, okay. So I think that for the second part of the talk, I would primarily focus on um, some statistical considerations of treating far cephalomide data. I think it's kind of early on when we are able to sample data faster and faster. Um, I think many studies kind of feel we will apparently will benefit from those shorter TRs, um, probably from like two major directions. And one direction is like with shorter TR, we can resolve signals in higher frequency bands. Um, so, for instance, in this kind of very nice study, they show actually um, fMRI is able to track oscillatory changes up to like 0.75 hertz. And also in the resting state regimes, people show normally we only look at functional connectivity below 0.1 hertz and filter the data like up to 0.1 hertz. But then uh, nowadays, because you can sample faster, you can see uh, fluctuations in higher frequency bands and um, they show like this connectivity actually persists in higher frequency bands. And another set of benefits kind of relate to increased sensitivity to neural activity. So on one hand, uh, by sampling faster, you can um, reduce the aliasing of those uh, quasi-periodical physiological dynamics. Uh, they won't alias into the low frequency bands. And on the other hand, um, there are some early studies claim that by sampling faster, you can have uh, more sample points. So this will increase your statistical power. Um, so uh, I think like the two kind of part of work I'm going to discuss is kind of relate to um, while we acknowledge there are lots of benefits from rapid sampling, but the benefits are not as straightforward as we early or as we have been considering. Um, so the first one I'm sharing is uh, to show how sometimes in you treating that data improperly can lead to some artifactual high frequency connectivity measures. Um, so uh, yeah, as I just mentioned, uh, we always consider uh, most of the fluctuations um, giving rise to resting state connectivity reside in uh, much lower frequency bands. So as shown here, like um, the time, this shows a power structure of the time course from different resting state networks, and then it's really in a quite low frequency band. Um, but like, there are some emerging studies demonstrating um, the connectivity actually persists in higher frequency bands. Um, there are even studies that are showing there is some causality relationship between different regions in spontaneous activity up to five hertz. Um, I wouldn't say they are not real, but the case is like um, the signals decay rapidly as um, frequency increases. So the contrast to noise ratio becomes very minor uh, or minimal, like at higher frequencies. So this kind of starts to motivate me to think whether there are certain ways in our pre-processing if we're not treating it properly can lead to some artifactual observations of um, connectivity patterns in higher frequency range. Um, so Actually, we later realized uh, linear neural sense regression um, might cause some like artifactual high frequency observations. So um, this is a common pre-processing step in fMRI data analysis. So you model the fMRI time series as a linear combination of different neural sense regressors, uh, and um, the remaining part are some white noise and uh, you know, spontaneous neural fluctuations. And then you project those neural sense sources out of the data. Um, and typically, it's just done using an ordinary laser square fitting. Um, so, but the case is like this is a temporal domain analysis. And for a while, um, the rationale behind it is like people are not interested in the frequency varying the characteristics of the data. And or your frequency of interest dominates this um, analysis. But as I have shown before, uh, for fMRI signals, uh, it decays rapidly as um, the frequency increases. So it's dominated by low frequency fluctuations. And it's similar for those neural sense regressors. So if we inspect the power spectra of some common neural sense regressors, and then you can see um, most of them are still dominated by very low frequency fluctuations. So um, that means that 
entire nuisance regression process will be dominated by the low frequency fluctuations. But we are interested in high frequency fluctuations. So the implicit assumption of nuisance regression is violated. Um, so from a mathematical perspective is, uh, if the fitting parameter beta is uh, dominated by um, low frequency fluctuations highlighted by the capital L here, and then uh, when we project it out of the data in the low frequency band, uh, it seems to denies the data wall. Um, but in the high frequency band, these parameters are not optimized for those regressors. Maybe by in turn, you will instead of projecting out um, high frequency nuisance, you will introduce additional high frequency variance to the data. So the question is whether these kind of um, coefficients uh, estimated from the low frequency band carry functional information. Um, so there is a very uh, nice study done before actually demonstrating where is uh, removed by those nuisance regression contain network structures. So what they do is like typically project those uh, nuisance out of the data, but uh, in this study, they apply independent component analysis to the nuisance projected out of the data. And then they were able to identify multiple um, spatial patterns just look like those resting state networks. Um, and this is because the variance removed by nuisance uh, regression contain, of course, those noisy fluctuations. But if you have a large number of nuisance regressors, they also constitute a low rank approximation of the high dimensional functional information. Um, an intuitive way to think about it is like, imagine you only have 100 time frames of your data, and now you have 100 uh, nuisance regressors. So all your functional information will be projected out of the data. So um, that's just an extreme case. But this means like the higher number of regressors you included in the data, um, and then the more functional information will be projected out of the data. So that kind of lays the foundation of the caveat of uh, whole band nuisance regression. So the data variance uh, removed out of the low frequency bands uh, contain network structures, as we just showed in the previous slide. So the regression parameter will also carry part of the functional information. And then when introduced to the high frequency bands, um, it may demonstrate some network patterns. Um, collectively, it suggests uh, even if your data doesn't have any high frequency correlations, if you apply nuisance regression to your data, you will be able to see some spurious high frequency connectivity. Um, to demonstrate this point, uh, we just performed some simulations. Um, we first generated dummy data sets based on real data, um, but this dummy data set has no functional connectivity above 0 0.2 hertz. So how we do that is um, this is the real data and for each voxels time series, um, we take the Fourier transform and then randomly shuffle the faces above 0 0.2 hertz, basically kind of destroying the um, high frequency structure in the data. And then we take the inverse Fourier transform and then we generate a new time series. So this dummy data sets basically in the low frequency band um, just uh, retain the intrinsic structure of the real data. But in the high frequency band, um, um, it's basically, it has no correlating patterns. And then um, we apply nuisance regression to these dummy data sets. We use combination of different uh, regressors. And then finally, uh, we try to see if after filtering data into different bands, we can see some artifactual patterns of connectivity. Um, so here are the um, results. Um, in the dummy data set, if you look at the correlation, if we place the seed in the um, PCC region, and then this is just one slice of the default mode network, uh, and it, below 0.2 hertz, you can see a very clear pattern of these uh, functional connectivity measures. But if you look at the correlation pattern in higher frequency bands, um, and you only see some random noise here. And then if you apply nuisance regression, so different columns here are just combination of different nuisance regressors. And then um, depending on which set of regressors you include, you kind of have different uh, results of how you denoise the data. But you can still see those um, default mode network patterns. But 
if you look at the high frequency bands, um, it's just uh, as the number of requesters increases, you start to see very clear patterns of the default mode network. Um, and then they are just purely introduced by the new sense regression. And even with just S2, S2 requesters of the Y matter and CSF signal, you can already see some like tiny patterns um, related to the default mode network. And then if we continue increasing the uh, band, um, you still see those um, uh, artifactual patterns. So um, this is a real data result. Um, so in the case original data prior to new sense regression, um, there are quite a minimal level of identifiable connectivity patterns in the data. But if you uh, filter it, uh, post new sense regression, you are going to see much cleaner uh, default mode network patterns, but it's kind of um, likely um, they can be artifactually introduced by neural sense regression. Um, so I think these results were just like uh, try to caution people if you are interested in those high frequency connectivity, probably instead of doing a whole band neural sense regression where we we'll introduce cross talks between frequencies, you should filter the both your data and then the regressors to the uh, band of interest, and then you perform neural sense regression within each specific band. Okay, um, and the last um, kind of line of um, topic is relates to how much we can benefit from rapid sampling in the statistical um, um, aspect. So why this is a kind of not a straightforward topic is um, we have more samples within a fixed scan duration. Uh, it, it actually comes at, at a penalty of reduced contrast to noise ratio per time frame. So this is a typical um, how fMRI signal are required. So you ex excite those things and later when to recover to a certain extent, and then you sample that data. So that means if you have shorter TR, the signal recovery uh, is kind of more modest. So every time you sample it, um, the signal intensity is much smaller compared to cases where you have a longer TR. Um, this is just an example of a real data. <laughs> if you look closely, it's actually a GIF file. So you can see how the images evolve at like 0.35 seconds or at the two seconds. Um, I'm showing this to image just like to show, although when you sample fast, you have more sample points, but your signal intensities are also much smaller compared to longer TR cases. So there is a trade-off between contrast to noise ratios and also the number of samples you have. So the question is, uh, if you ask an MR technician, uh, what's the optimal TR of my study? And then uh, in earlier literatures, you will commonly see an expression uh, or they performed by doing a phantom inside the scanner and then calculate, oh, how did like, um, dot plot uh, product of TSNR and the square root of N uh, changes as a function of TR. Um, the rationale is TSNR is almost a um, reflection of the contrast to noise ratio. And N is just shows the degree of freedom, how many independent samples you have uh, for scan. So this will give you a rough approximation of your statistical gains. And then always you see there will be some increase uh, when the TR shortens. And then uh, until um, certain cases where in, uh, the like multi-band factor or the performance of the hardware and the aliasing algorithm uh, kind of start to degrade. So you will see a drop in the predicted statistical gains. Um, but like more recently, there are more uh, studies kind of applying or comparing um, different acceleration factors in different settings of both task and resting state studies and in different parameters, they found like the gain are not that straightforward to predict. And also the prediction always deviate from what you see from the simple prediction from TSNR and the square root of N. So in the next few slides, um, I'm just trying to build some intuition regarding the um, potential complexity of those uh, predicting the SMS benefits. So uh, first is like, Depending on your statistical models, um, this is not always an accurate measure of your statistical benefits. So I give um, kind of two analysis generated from the same data sets. 
So the first one is um, you always use G general linear model to study task activation. And in this case, you compare um, visual activation at different TRs. Uh, and then you plot the average T scores relative to the results at TR of two seconds. So that's why I call it normalized gains. And different lines here shows uh, you smooth the data by different kernel size. And you always see, it seems like uh, it have a gain in statistical power when TR shortens. And if you compare it to the prediction by the local TSMR times the square root of N, you feel, oh, it actually predicts pretty well. And then now for the same data sets, if you want to look at the functional connectivity patterns, you place a seed in the auditory uh, cortex and look at the uh, correlation in the contralateral sites and you plot the statistical gains as a function of TR, you will notice actually the gain seems very modest as you go um, gradually reduce the TR. And if you look at TSNR times the square root of N, in these cases, they actually predict an increase just as a task activation. Um, so this is just a simple example showing, depending on your questions you are looking at, you may benefit differently uh, from um, like fast sampling, even or other scanning environment acquisition parameters remain identical. Um, the reason for it is actually very straightforward. It's just for different models, we have different penalty on contrast to noise ratio. So um, for instance, um, for general linear model, based task activation, we always model the signal as a linear combination of task contrast plus some um, noise and the noise are kind of autocorrelated, so they have their intrinsic uh, serial correlation structure. And then uh, I just uh, put the final results here. So basically, if you look at the statistical outcomes, it's almost a linear function of contrast noise ratio times the square root of n. Um, so why um, the degree of freedom almost like an n is like in most um, fMI toolboxes, um, they were use a pre widening process. So basically uh, applying a pre widening matrix, making the residuals to be independent from each other. So you will have a kind of recover the degree of freedom you lost from the data. So in this case, that's why the prediction of the TSNR times square root of N kind of will predict the results of the task activation. But for a linear Pearson correlation, we always do functional connectivity. Um, it really depends on how people pre-process the data. But this also is just a simple uh, simplification of the expression. So if the contrast to noise ratio is pretty low, um, you can notice like the function of contrast to noise ratio is super linear. So that means when you have a contrast to noise ratio penalty as TR shortens, they will have a, a more stronger penalty on the final t statistical scores compared to tax activation case. And here is the effective degrees of freedom. Um, Pre-widening is not a common step for resting state connectivity um, because when you do pre-widening, um, it's slightly complicated, but will incur uh, some penalty on the contrast to noise ratio side too. But I'm kind of showing here is basically showing the effective degrees of freedom are also much smaller than the total number of frames due to signal autocorrelation. So the combination of these two factors kind of will lead to why um, when you sometimes do linear Pearson correlation, you will find like the statistical benefits are more modest compared to you apply the same protocol to task activation. Um, so as I mentioned, um, these gains really depend on how you analyze the data. So it just also give an example of how you process the data may kind of change what is optimal TR you want to use. So in the functional connectivity case, we just showed, oh, it seems like the TR of 1.4 seconds gives the optimal statistical gains. But then if you do provide into the data, um, you can see there will be a, a more stronger decay in the statistical power as you go to shorter TRs. And sometimes people do a low pass filtering to the data. I think the gain in with low pass filtering is like it enhance the contrast to noise ratio. But on the other hand, it will kind of reduce your degrees of freedom because you do low pass filtering will introduce uh, autocorrelation in the data. And then um, if you compare or see how the statistical gains change as a function of TR, um, 
it actually like for 1.4 seconds doesn't differ too much by uh, from cases when you go to lower um, TRs. So um, this just want to give you an idea there are so many parameters um, in the way you analyze the data can also affect how much you can gain from uh, faster sampling. And um, here is just another intuitive example. So um, the different color lines here are show the data where you start with different contrast to noise ratio. And then the different row here are shows different pre-processing ways for the um, linear Pearson correlation. And um, I just want to give an intuitive example when you have different fractional contribution from your white noise that can be introduced by um, your scanning environment, your coil configuration, all kinds of hardware parameters. And then you will have totally different trend of how the statistical gains change as a function of um, TRs. And here it shows another um, factor like how your signal autocorrelated with each other can also significantly, um, significantly impact how much you will gain by going to shorter and shorter TRs. Um, so I just want to use the examples like to highlight um, <laughs> it's really complicated to determine how well your study will benefit from fast sampling. It's not as straightforward as uh, um, several earlier um, literatures have demonstrated. Um, to make a summary of the second part um, of um, the statistical concerns relating to rapid sampling, um, we first show uh, linear nuisance regression uh, can introduce uh, some spurious uh, high frequency functional connectivity measures. So the recommendation for studies interested in these high frequency measures, uh, we just recommend you use match band regression. So basically filter the signal and noise to similar bands and project out of the data to avoid potential crosstalks between frequencies. Um, and the second message is like due to the complicated trade-offs between contrast to noise ratio loss and increased degrees of freedom, it's actually not straightforward to determine the efficacy of rapid sampling. Um, there are many factors in your study design, statistical models, and signal characteristics can also affect the potential benefits of fast sampling. Uh, for instance, like we use general linear model, which is a common way to look at task activation and linear Pearson correlation, which is a common way to look at functional connectivity. Um, because of the distinction in their statistical assumptions, uh, their predicted gains are quite different. Um, and this may be a sad uh, information, although there are lots of empirical comparisons out there, but it's very hard to, for you to draw uh, very insightful information regarding what's the optimal TR for your own study. So we should always pilot acquisitions as well as the experimental design and the particular analysis pipeline you want to use to determine the optimal protocol for a specific study aim. Um, so there are lots of uh, factors related to fast sampling. I wouldn't uh, have time to cover all of them, but if you are interested, um, I work with my mentors at Stanford and also Martino Center um, just like to have some discussions of some potential aspects of those rapid samples from my data. Okay, um, so I think collectively, <laughs> I hope um, these kind of two lines of information kind of help convey the message. Uh, fMRI is really a powerful tool for neural imaging, but it has very complicated signal characteristics. Um, so I feel like for the first study, uh, we just have want to highlight the importance to consider and address these apparent physiological dynamics when we interpret uh, resting state functional connectivity findings. And for the second line, um, um, it's, it's really sad, but there is no um, pre-processing guideline or acquisition protocol that is universally optimized for every study. So especially if the data you acquired or your question you are interested in kind of deviate from this common uh, analysis. So it's kind of important to review all those pre-present step <laughs> and uh, analytical kind of pipelines to make sure uh, they wouldn't cause some like artifacts in your final observations. Okay, um, so with all of that, I want to acknowledge uh, my mentors at the, and colleagues at the Martino Center and also at the Stanford University. Um,
and it's uh, finally we just want, I'm happy to take any questions if you have. Yeah, thanks. Fantastic stuff. Thank you so much. Uh, lots to think about there when you next time you send in front of your fMRI data um, or plan an experiment. Are there any questions from uh, the audience, either through chat or, or in person? Yeah, Jane, go ahead. Thanks, that was a really great talk, really enjoyed it. Um, my first question was about, uh, you said a couple of times, sort of if you choose to treat physiological parameters as a nuisance, almost like as if there's a question there whether or not to treat them that way. So are there a lot of cases where you would not treat those as a nuisance and why not? Oh yeah, I actually have a background slide related to it. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, let's see. Maybe. Oh yeah, this one. So um, I think the case is like, one thing I didn't mention is I, I just show all the both fluctuations are coupled to physiological measures, but they are coupled, it doesn't mean the physiological measures are caused for them. So there are cases the neural activity can couple with all those systemic physiological measures. For instance, uh, here just shows a case when the coupling can be around load dependent. So if you put the subject in the scanner here, they are alert and later they become a bit jolly. And you can look at the um, global fMRI signal and the respiratory variation. When they are awake, the coupling are not that strong, but when they become sleepy, the coupling is kind of become very strong. So it's hard to separate them. But in this case, they are coupled. You don't know whether, um, um, I didn't show here, but in this study and also a recent science paper, they really show those global fMRI signal also coupled to the K-complex um, areas when people fall asleep. So that means there are two possibilities. One possibility is like both these respiratory variation and fMRI signal are downstream effects of those global neuronal changes. There's also another possibility of um, this fMRI signal or just every phenomenon of these physiological changes. So in those cases, it's hard to separate them. <laughs> so uh, in, that's kind of one case where um, I cannot say this is just nuisance because they coupled with respiratory variation. There are also cases like when people do pain study. Uh, there are many cases or other cases when people s changes in systemic physiology is like of interest or they just couple it to fMRI dynamics. You cannot separate them. I think those are kind of controversial cases. Uh, I don't know whether that answers your question. Yeah, that really does. Thank you. Um, my own other question, which is just about whether I'm interpreting the second half of your talk properly, which is, um, I guess, a takeaway that I think maybe uh, came out of it for me is if you're doing task fMRI, you should accelerate and try and get shorter, um, at least with, with standard processing pipelines, like with pre-whitening, then you should definitely do um, short TRs. But if you're doing resting state, um, maybe with a, a, a sort of a typical processing pipeline, you should not necessarily strive for such a short TR. Is that fair to say, or is that have I misinterpreted your whole point? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I think that's also another great point. Uh, so, so first, I want to um, I I kind of like I agree. Like the message we try to convey is really probably for linear Pearson correlation or suffers from a stronger penalty in contrast to noise ratio when you go to shorter TRs. But the parameters, or it kind of depends on where you start with. The data we have here um, kind of showing like when you go to shorter TR, there is really a decrease in your um, statistical power. But if you start with a different case, that's how we show the simulation results here. <laughs> um, yeah. Right, so in some cases, like depending how much your contrast and noise ratio and signal characteristics, you can probably gain a little bit by going to shorter TRs. It really depends on your data, um, as you can see here too. Uh, another case is I agree in general cases, if there is no other downsides of um, fire sampling for task conditions, you may benefit from going to shorter, but it's not always the shorter the better. Um, the case is like, um, I didn't talk about the concern of hardware implementation. Are assuming 
the reconstruction of fast sampling is perfect. <laughs> but in real cases, when people do those TS similar times square root of n, it's not always go keep going saturate. That's the ideal case, right? But sometimes it's like the um, some algorithm for reconstruction wouldn't perform well when you have um, multiple slices kind of acquired at the same time. So basically go into shorter TRs. Um, that's kind of some degradation of both the image quality you get by going to shorter TR. So I think some sweet spot may be somewhere in between. That kind of depends on your particular coil and acquisition and MR parameters you set. But if all the other concerns are identical, in general, I would believe um, um, task activation may gain more from fast sampling compared to resting state connectivity measures. Um, yeah, I don't know how that. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's also very clear. I mean, clear and also really complicated. So thanks for uh, the, the, the talk. It was really good. Thank you. Thanks. Are there any other questions from uh, the audience? I had a question. Um, when, you, when you showed your data sets with increased complexity, I guess, in the nuisance regression and the motion, yeah. you want to go back to that slide? Like, I, so are you, are you saying that basically uh, at different frequency bands, so the biggest contribution will always be from these lower frequency bands and then at the higher frequency bands, you're kind of amplifying the contribution based on the inclusion of, of more complex uh, motion and nuisance regression. It, uh, yeah, nuisance regressors, is that kind of the, the takeaway here? Oh, yeah, I think the case is like, um, yeah, I think it just I mentioned if you have like 100 time frames, um, so, and you have 100 nuisance regressors, and you apply nuisance regression, you kind of basically project every information out. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so it's kind of how many regressors just jump between two extremes. One is like no functional information projected on the data, and you have a lot of regressors, you will project a lot of fraction of functional information from your data out. So here it's just showing, uh, yeah, I didn't, I forgot to mention that uh, this direction basically, as you go to later and lo later, there are more and more regressors in the data. So when you have more regressors, there will be more functional information projected out of the data. Right. So that's why they will be introduced to the uh, high frequency bands. Okay. This is a fantastic talk. I mean, there's lots to think about here. Um, you know, uh, if there are, if there are any other questions, we're running a bit late, but if anyone else has a question, uh, if no one else does, then what I'll do is, um, maybe if you guys want to mute yourself, feel comfortable and just maybe, uh, provide us with the proper amount of applause, cause this is a really lovely talk. Thanks so much. <laughs>